title of my sermon this morning is How to Have an Obedient Wife. How to Have an Obedient Wife. I was just thinking about this yesterday because of the marriage and everything like that. So the part of the chapter I want to focus on in Titus 2 is when the Bible says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behaviour as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be so... I, something that's funny about this passage, this passage is like your lefty's worst nightmare. It just like escalates as it gets through. It's like, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that's all right. That they may teach the young women to be sober, and look at this, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste. It just gets worse and worse for the lefty. Keepers at home, good obedient to their own husbands. That's why when it climaxes for them, their minds just explode. Obedient to their own husbands. At the word of God, be not blasphemed. So today I'm going to talk about how to have an obedient wife. Now before the ladies in the audience kind of like roll off and go, oh no, this sermon is actually geared towards the men. Because the title of the sermon is not how to be an obedient wife. We'll have that Maybe another time. Maybe next week. I don't know. <laughs> this sermon is about how to have an obedient wife. Right? What you can do as a man to encourage your wife to do what God has commanded her, which is to be obedient to her own husband. All right? So I'm preaching to the men in the church today. And really, these principles can be applied in area, any area of leadership. But I'm applying the practical examples mainly when it comes to the home. Now my first point is men lead and women follow. That's how God has it. You know, the world doesn't like it, but honestly, I don't care what the world thinks, I care what God thinks. And the way God has it is men lead and women follow. And it's not only in the home when it comes to the marriage. Ephesians 5 verse 22, wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Look at this in verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ. So look at the type of obedience God expects from a woman to her husband is likened to the, the, the submissiveness of a church to Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you, when you think of how a church or to submit to Jesus Christ. What would you think of that? You think, well, it's in everything. This is why the Bible says here, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So notice it's to their own husbands. So it's not saying that you just obey. You know, some people get this twisted idea that you just have to obey every man in church. Any man tells you to do something, you got to do it. So it's not that women just obey men. It's that women need to be obedient to their own husbands in everything. So in the home, not only in the home, but in the church as well, men are in charge. First Timothy 3, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now in our circle, most people know this term as pastor. They call the leader of a church a pastor. The actual term in the Bible, the office, is called a bishop, and pastoring is what you do, right? So it's sort of like your role at work. You have your title, Right? And then you'll have what you do, your responsibilities as that person. So pastoring is what people do, because people who are not bishops can also pastor. But bishops are the people that actually take up that position. He desires a good work. Look, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. So notice, you must be a man to take up the role of bishop in a church, and deacon as well. Why? Because... You can't be the husband of one wife if you're a woman. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, <coughs> apt to teach. So not only in the home do men lead and women are meant to follow, but in the church, men are meant to lead and women follow, but also in a nation, men are meant to lead and women are meant to follow. Because look, when you look at Isaiah 3, look at one of the the, uh, the ways a nation can be oppressed. When God is talking about his people here in Isaiah 3, he says, as for my people, look at this, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. Oh, my people, 
They which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy parts. So you see, when they're in an unideal situation, what's going on in that nation? Children are in charge and women are in charge. Because what's the ideal scenario? What does God want? That men are in charge. So men lead and women follow. So then you ask the question, well, well why men? Why does it have to be men that lead and, and not women? Right? So Because you can't just have equal, because if it's equal, you can't have multiple leaders. There has to be one person at the top. So if you say, well, why men? And then you could ask the question, well, why should it be the women? Why should a woman lead as opposed to men? So ultimately it comes down to <coughs> what God has ordained. Right? God in the beginning has ordained man and wife, and the man leads the home, as we read in Ephesians 5. <coughs> but what are some other reasons? Why does God have it this way? Like, why do men have authority over women in the home and in the church and in, in society, how they should have it in society? Because if you think about it, society really is just built up of families, isn't it? So it starts in the family. Men in charge in the family, it should naturally, if men are in charge in the family, then men should be in charge in church because they're the men of those families. And then likewise, society. So these are concentric circles. It's not like there's a difference there. But 1 Timothy 2, look at what it says here. Let the, women, women, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. So this is talking about the teaching time during church, which is what you're sitting through now. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So what is this verse saying here? What this verse is saying here is that women are more easily deceived than men. That's just how, how God has it, right? So because women are more easily deceived than men, this is why God doesn't want women in charge. And the way we see it, what is it referring to? Well, in the beginning, when Eve ate of the fruit of the tree, we see there that pattern set from the very beginning, from which we derive our human nature, right? Adam and Eve, that the woman was more easily deceived by the serpent. So Adam was not deceived when he ate of the fruit. He willingly disobeyed God when he obeyed, well, he, when he hearkened to his wife more than he hearkened to God. Now, what is it saying here? It's saying, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. So that, that's not saying that women have to have children in order to be saved and go to heaven. The question is, what is she being saved from? She's being saved from deception, being saved from going to the world, being a busybody, a tattler, an, an idle woman, just going from house to house, a busybody. It's saying, when women bear children, it keeps things in order, right? And it's not just for the women, right? Because if you think about it, like a woman who's a bit off the rails and then she has a child, she starts thinking, man, I've got to start looking after this child. I better start being responsible and things like that. So children have that effect, not only on women, but also on men. When a man has a child as well, you know, sometimes that makes them also uh, pick up their responsibility as well. I mean, even in your own lives, as your children start to grow, you start reflecting on, you know, what sort of person you are, what sort of Christian you are, what sort of example you're setting, because you actually start to see it in your children. <laughs> and you start to see it in your children, and you're like, oh man, I better change it if I want my children to replicate what I'm doing. So one is, it's sensibility, right? Women are more easily deceived. Now in Ephesians 5, look at this. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he may present it to himself, <coughs> a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So yes, Ephesians 5 teaches that women ought to submit to their husbands. But at what expense? See, a lot of women, they, they only focus on one side and they just think, oh, why is that's not fair that women have to submit to their husband? Why well, don't think it's fair that I have to die for you and you don't have to die for me? You know what I mean? So, you know, I think it's a bit of give and take here and then there you go, even's even. You know, I, I have to die for you and you have to do what I say. Right, that's how it works. So in Ephesians 5, you have the responsibility. So why does God give 
that authority to the man, well, again, more stable in terms of deception. Another one is that he has the responsibility to protect his family. Therefore, because if you are responsible for protecting them, therefore, you need the authority to, to, to make those decisions that would protect them. And we see this principle here in Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So notice there, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account. So it's like at your workplace. Why does your boss have authority over you? Well, because he's responsible for your actions. So likewise in the home, God has held the man responsible, not the woman. And that's why man is in charge. And not only that, you have the stability there when it comes to deception as well. So men lead, women follow. <laughs> now let's get into the meat of the sermon. <coughs> How to get obedience. How to get obedience. Now, if you were to ask some Christians, how do you get obedience from your wife? And some sermons that you might listen to may give you this impression. You may get this idea that all you have to do is just open your Bible to Ephesians 5 and tell her, look, the Bible says, be obedient to your husband in everything. Titus 2, obedient to their own husbands. And I'm just going to tell her, I'm going to tell her, I'm going to show her who's boss, let her know who's boss in the house, and that's how, that's how we're going to deal with it. You know, I just let her know, I just put my foot down, just tell her. Now, for those of you who have a brain in the room, you're probably thinking, that obviously is not going to work. But, you know, the funny thing is, there are actually young, naive Christian men out there that think that's how it works. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, she's just, everything's just going on, whatever, but as soon as she makes those vows, you know, she's probably, I'm just going to tell her to do it, and then she's just going to follow me. She's just going to obey me. Now, I agree that this is what women should do. Right? So I agree that, that you may be right in that, that your shortcomings as a man does not justify her being dis disobedient to the Word of God. But this sermon, like I said, it's not about what a woman should do. Right? We all know what women should do. The question is, how do you get a woman to do this if she, if she is not doing it? Right? How, what can you do as a man to help that? Right? So that's what we want to talk about today. So I've got three areas to talk about. So if you think about your, your wife obeying you, an obedient wife. It all starts with respect, doesn't it? Like the Bible says in Ephesians 5. It talks about, well, I don't have it here in my, my verses, but at the end it says, you know, let every man love his husband and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Reverence, respect. So you think about, well, if I want my wife to follow me, I want my wife to obey me, I need my wife to respect me. So how do you get your wife to respect you if she doesn't respect you? Well, you've got, to sell, you've got to ask yourself this question. Are you a man that is worthy of respect? So rather than focusing on she doesn't respect me, oh, and my wife, she won't show me respect, you know, she says she's a Christian and she's, she's meant to respect me. Well, rather than putting it on her to make the change for you, you as a man ought to ask yourself the question, are you even a man worthy of respect? Are you attaining to a point where somebody could respect you? Right? Ephesians 5 verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So how do you get respect from your wife? How do you be somebody worthy of respect? Well, do you have a worthy mission for your life? Like, if you think about what are you trying to obtain in your life, what are you doing with your life, is it something worthwhile? Like, if you just sit around doing nothing, you know, you ask, hey, what are you going to do with your life? I don't know. Every weekend, you're sitting on the couch playing video games, watching the footy, 
you know, the weekend, you're hanging out with your mates, you're not going anywhere in your life. How do you expect a woman to respect that? You know, she, she wants somebody to follow and you're not somebody worth following. Right? So if you want her to follow you, you want her to respect you, do you even have a worthy mission for your life worth getting behind? And that's why it comes down to, you know, your spiritual life. How are you going to serve God? Look at Colossians. And this is something we've got to pray for, for one another. You know, I pray for this for you guys when I think about you guys as well. Look at this. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You know, in Ephesians, it talks about the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You know, you understand these things. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. See, are you walking worthy? If you're walking worthy, you're striving for that, then you will be somebody that will be able to command that respect from your wife. And if you command that respect and she respects you, hey, it's going to be a lot easier for her to obey that commandment. Now, like I said, I'm not justifying rebellious women. I'm not justifying rebellious wives or rebellious children. But what I'm saying is, this is what you are able to do as a man in order to help your wife keep that commandment as the leader. So are you worthy of respect? Think about what are your goals in life? What are you trying to achieve? If you think about what you're trying to achieve in your life and all arrows point this way, that's how you lose respect in the eyes of, your, of, your, of a woman, right? But you know, if you have your eyes focused on the prize, on the Lord Jesus Christ, then that's a, that's a, that's a goal worthy of following. Do you even have any goals? Like I said, you're just floating through life, not even really having something that you want to do for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, how do those goals align with the Great Commission? You know, sometimes men have a goal, but their goal may not be serving themselves. It may be serving community, you know, serving other people to get recognition and whatnot. So you may have goals in your life. You may be something that you're accomplishing, but the question is, how do those goals align up with accomplishing the Great Commission. So you need to make sure that we always have the Great Commission in mind when we think about what our goals are. And a spiritual woman doesn't just want to follow somebody that's just you know, making money or doing all that. They want to follow somebody that is, you know, especially a, a godly wife, wants to follow somebody that is doing something for the Lord. <laughs> but that doesn't also negate the fact that whatever you do, your goals in life, need to provide for your family as well. Because you need both, right? At the same time, you don't want your whole life to just be about making money, and then you lose respect spiritually. But sometimes people get it imbalanced the other way, yeah. right? And they just, everything is spiritual, and they just you, you neglect their job and neglect everything to serve God. You know what? If you're serving God, and your wife can't put food on the table for her children, you're going to lose respect as well. Right? Because you're not fulfilling your responsibility. And that's why in 1 Timothy 5, look at this, but if any provide not for his own, so he's talking about providing materialistically for your family, right? And especially for those of his own house. Look at this, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. He can be worse than an infidel. Can anything be worse than somebody that has not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and the wrath of God is abiding on them and yet God says you've denied the faith and you're worse than an infidel when you don't provide for your family. So these people that get this idea where they just serve God, serve God, serve, and, their, and their family is not provided for, they have no idea where their income is going to come from, you know, that's not somebody of faith. Who's just thinking, oh, I'm just going to go faith and just trust God and just no idea where that money's going to come from. The Bible says here, if you can't, if you don't provide for your own, you've denied the faith and you're worse than an infidel. So are you worthy of respect? That's the first one. So rather than thinking, she doesn't respect me, are you a man worthy of respect? Now what's the second area? Second area is, are you leading... Or are you lording? Are you leading or are you lording? So what's the difference then? <coughs> like we talked about in the beginning, where young, naive men will just think, 
I'll just tell her to obey me and she'll do it. Should she? Yes. Will she? That's another question. But that's how you lord. Lord is just when you're telling people what to do. Right? What is leading? Leading is when you're showing them what to do. You're showing them. You're, you're in front. Different ways that you can lead, and we'll talk about that. First Peter 5. <laughs> Feed the flock of God which is among you. So this is instruction, obviously, to leaders in a church, but the same principle can apply. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So you see how God gives us a principle here. How should we be a leader? Are we a leader? And even, it's funny because, you know, these principles that we learn, I mean, even the corporate world has picked these things up. I mean, in the corporate world, you learn about the difference between management and leadership. And what's the difference? Management is about delegating tasks, telling people what to do, rostering, keeping people accountable, everything like that. But what's being a leader? A leader is that you show them how to work hard. You show them how to have the right attitude. You show them how to you know, resolve conflict and go about things. You lead by example. And then that will inspire those who follow you to follow in your footsteps. So be somebody respectful uh, worthy of respect, but are you leading or are you lording? Are you a leader? Are you setting, <coughs> do you set the example for your family, in your family? Like when it comes to higher standards, taking care of your family, like when you look after your kids, and, and as the man, if you're leading in your family, are you taking the lead when it comes to setting the right behavior for your kids and saying, hey, this is how you ought to behave. This is how you ought to talk. This is how you sit when you eat. This is how you respond to people. This is how you talk. And are you like that? So rather than just lording over your family, telling your wife, hey, this is how you should, you should be more zealous for God. Hey, why don't you show her how to do it? You be more zealous. You behave in the way that you want your family to behave. So are you leading or are you lording? And like I said, it's the same when it comes to your children. What's an example where you're leading in your family? Right? When, you, when it comes to taking care of your children, I, I talk about this a lot. When it comes to taking care of your children, you know, a lot of men, unfortunately, just leave taking care of the children to their wife. Right? They leave the discipline, they leave the correction, they leave the training. See, this is where you are not leading in your family. And if you do this in your family, you will lose respect from your wife. So, so this is why, when it, I mean, think about when it comes to disciplining your children. You say your wife is struggling with disciplining the children. right? And I'm not talking about anyone in particular here. Right? I'm just talking about all, all of you. If your wife's struggling with disciplining the children, how do you do that? How do you handle that? Do you just talk to her and say, well, this is what you should do. That is what you should do. Maybe you're not doing this enough. Maybe you're not doing that enough. Or do you take the bulls by the horn, the bull by the horns, and when the child plays up, you take the child and you spank the child and discipline the child and correct the child and love the child in the way you want your wife to do it. Right? So if she is struggling to do it, do you lead in that area? Do you show her or do you just leave it to her? You say, oh, that's, not, that's her problem. Right? That's her job. No, no, no. It's your job as well to lead in that area and to spank your children. You know, my wife says, so, you know, sometimes, because women get a bit more emotional, right? So women, you know, sometimes they, they don't spank as quickly as they should to, 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 to solve an issue. So they end up screaming at their children, right? They shout at their children. So what sort of example do you set in the family? Are you shouting at your children as well? Or are you setting the example where, hey, you can calmly talk to them. You can correct them in a way that you want your wife to correct them. It was funny, my, my wife mentioned this to me last night, and she goes, you're, you're spanking your children, you're not exercising them. And I'm like, exercising them? Like exercising them? No, exorcising them. So you're not like exorcising them, like trying to get the dead, like the power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. Trying to get this uh, de demon out of them. But sometimes when the way people deal with their children, you think they are exorcising something out of their children, as opposed to spanking them. So if your wife is struggling in this area when it comes to the home, hey, how are you leading in this area? How do you show your wife how to do it? Show her how to do it, not just what to do. 
So not only that, not only when it comes to the punishment, but also what about the education of your children? You know, when you're talking with your children and your children ask questions, are you leading your home in that area where you are weaving in Bible and the Word of God into everyday conversation? And you know, this is a lot easier to do when you actually live it. You know, the Christian life is a lot easier when you're just all the way in. You know, and if you're just genuine about it, you, you, you get in church, you're on fire for God, living the Christian life and being a good example is, is a lot easier. Right? But when you have to turn it on and off, right? when, you, when you have no desire to serve the, for the things of God, when you leave church, but in this building, it's like, oh, hey, brother, it's good to see you. God bless you. God bless. When you have to turn it on, it's very hard. Right? So it's better that you just think of it as a lifestyle. You know? when, you, when you serve God, it's not just a time when you do it. It's the same at home. Rather than just thinking, oh, you know, yeah, we've got to teach our children the Bible. Maybe we should implement like, you know, every Friday night we have an hour where we read and sing and do this. You know, am I, am I against family devotions like that? I'm not. But to me, I just think it's way more effective is if serving God is just a lifestyle of service. It's just part of your life. It's just who you are. It's just who you are, then that's the example you're going to set to your children. So do you lead in that area, not only when it comes to discipline, but in educating your children how to talk to them? <clears throat> Now, not only how you talk to your children, but do you also lead in your home and where you can get respect from your wife is, how do you talk to your wife? You know, how, how do you talk to your wife? When you ask things of her, do you have the attitude of just commanding her to do things? I mean, you could, you could go about your home that way. You know, Elizabeth, do this. Elizabeth, do that. Elizabeth, do this. But is that going to command her respect? You know, so you've got to think about how you talk to them. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying please and thank you and smile. I appreciate you doing Thank you for doing this for me. You know, could she do that for you? Should she do that for you anyway? Yes. Right? But, you know, if you show some appreciation, you know, this is going to make somebody more willing to follow and more happy to be a follower. It's no different at work. You know, if you have a boss that recognizes you, right? Aren't you more happy to help them look good in front of their boss? So, it reminds me of that song that you might not know, The Penguin and the Panda. They were perfectly polite. If you don't say please and thank you, it's just not right. Right? So, how do you talk to your wife? Now, leading, <laughs> leading means going from, oh, actually, I, just, I want to show you this passage. This is, this is the one. So, I want to show you an example in the Bible of somebody who had the authority to just tell somebody what to do, but asked nicely, right? And that's what I think this, this, chap, this, this book is about. This book is about Paul beseeching you know, Philemon for Onesimus, which was a servant that ran away. Now this book, Philemon, it's only one chapter, all right? So if you want to go home, and say, like, oh, I read a whole book of the Bible, just start, like, at these chapters. Just read Philemon, Obadiah, Jude. Oh, there you go, three books, down. All right, that's three chapters. So Philemon. But look at what he says here in verse 8. He says, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoy me that which is convenient. So he's saying here, he's basically saying in this verse, even though I could just tell you what to do and you ought to do it, right? He says, Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the agent, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Because what's happening here is he's asking, he's asking uh, Philemon to take Onesimus back. And, wh and while he's saying here, well, I could just tell you to take him back, he says, hey, I'd rather, for love's sake, that you are willing to do what I ask, you know? So having this attitude of how you talk to one another. Now, leading your family, like I said, this is by example, but leading means you're in front. Right? If you're going to be a leader in your home, that means you're in front. Right? You don't lead from behind. You lead from in front. So what are some areas where we think about leadership and leading and getting the respect of your wife to follow you? Are you actually leading her? Are you in front? So think about maybe your knowledge, your level of knowledge. 
These words should never come out of the mouth of a Christian man. My wife knows more Bible than I do. Never. Because you're meant to be leading your wife. You're meant to be in front. So that means if you don't know as much Bible as your wife, you better get learning, buddy. Start learning some Bible so that you can lead your wife in that area. Because yeah, this is a spiritual world, you know, a spiritual life we're living here. The words that I speak unto you, Jesus says, they are spirit and they are life. If you're living a spiritual life, you've got to know the word of God. If your wife knows more Bible than you do, that's a pretty good sign. She's more spiritual than you are and you're not in front. Right? So you need to lead in that area. You need to know your Bible more than her. For when, for the time, you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And I become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. Strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So the Bible's saying here, if you don't know the word of God very well, you're a babe in Christ. Now just like you're not going to follow a baby in your life, at work. I mean, why would your wife want to follow a babe in Christ when it comes to your spiritual life? So if you're a baby, you need to grow to the point where you're getting, you're eating some strong meat. You know, the Bible talks about different, you know, there's different passages that, you know, some is milk, it's easy to take in, it's sweet, it's encouraging. You know, God commanded his love toward us while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then there are those Old Testament passages that you probably haven't even turned to. You know, those are some strong meat. So, are you leading her in your Bible reading? Do you work harder than her? I mean, she's, got, she's going to be more willing to keep your home if you're working hard yourself. You know, they say a woman's work is never done. It goes from... Right and sunrise to sun down. Uh, it was meant to rhyme. I'm not sure how that works. Woman's work is the sun, rise to sun, setting of the sun, never done. So think about it, right? You come home from work, you're tired. But then she doesn't stop working. So then the question is, are you a hard worker? You may go, yeah, I work hard at work, but then when you get home, are you still working hard? Because her job didn't finish when you got home, but you think your job finishes. No. Right, so when it comes to leading, are you working hard as well? Are you working as hard as her? Because you know what? If you're going to lead in knowledge, you also have to lead in effort. And if you're a lazy man, that's the sort of man that loses respect in the eyes of his wife. What about for church? You know, I see people rock up late for church. Sometimes I see people, you know, even in our own life, your wife, I hear about your wife has to wake you up for church. Now, if your wife has to wake you up for church, who does that tell you is more zealous about the things of God? That they're up, ready. To go, at least they have the shame to think, come on, I want to get to church on time. I'm waking you up out of bed. Oh man, if you're that guy, you've got to be ashamed of yourself. You know, ashamed of yourself that your wife has to wake you up to go to church. Right? You ought to lead in that area where you're more zealous about the things of God. You ought to be more eager to get here than her. A few others I've got. What about when it comes to conflict? Leading in your home, being the leader. Do you make the first move when something goes wrong in the home? That's the way you can be a leader. And you'll get the respect of your wife because you're making the first move, you're leading. And that's how, every, that's how everybody should go about conflict. Matthew 18, I don't even ever notice this, I've, I've said these things a lot, but it's always good to repeat them. <coughs> Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone, and if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Now what I always like to point out in this passage here, notice who is the one that is going to reconcile. Is it the one that has done wrong? No. It's the one that has been wronged. 
I don't even notice that. If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So you see how it's the person that's been wrong is meant to be the one that's trying to reconcile, right? And to try and make things right and go and have that discussion. So when it comes to conflict in the family, do you lead in that area as well? Do you make the first move? Do you bring things up? Do you foresee the evil before it happens? Look at what it says here in Proverbs 22. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. See, do you see problems before they happen? This is what you've got to do as a man, right? You've got to see, hey, this could be a problem. I've got to bring up this conversation. I bring it up. I bring these things up. This is one way you can lead in your home. And the last one I have in this area, in terms of leading your home, is do you have the boldness to speak on behalf of your family? <coughs> this is how you can get respect from your wife as well. Sometimes men, they, they leave their women to, to do everything. You know, it's very, it's, it's very unchristian to have these matriarchal societies. Where women are running everything. Women are saying everything. You know, women are like, oh, you know, the husband at the side, you know, let me talk. This guy's you know, he's silly. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So you need to have the boldness and the knowledge to be able to take a stand for your family and address these things. And, you know, if you have a good relationship with your wife and you, you foresee the evil, Right? You know, hey, we, might come, we, we have to get on board together first so that when I take a stand for my family, I know I have my wife behind me. And the more you're on board, the more you take a stand for your family, you have the boldness to take a stand. Number one, if you have the boldness to take a stand for your family, that will command respect. And number two, if she can trust the fact that you take a stand for your family, then, like I said, she's more willing to get behind you because... You know, when, when you do take a stand, she agrees with you, right? Because you've done the, your homework beforehand. Proverbs 28, verse 1, look at this. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous as bold, are bold as a lion. So boldness comes hand in hand with how you live as a Christian. If you're leading, if you're zealous for the things of God, if you're growing in your spiritual life, that's automatically going to give you boldness and confidence. You have a good relationship with your wife and then you can start leading and she will be more likely to follow. Now the last one I want to talk about is do you listen? So we talked about <clears throat> are you worthy of respect? Are you somebody worth following? That's one area you can focus on. Second area you can focus on is are you leading by example? Are you actually in front? Or are you just trying to tell her what to do from behind? And number three, on my sixth point in this sermon, is do you listen to her? Do you listen to her? Because you might say, yeah, I'm working hard, I'm leading, you know, I'm doing things for the things of God. But what about when your wife doesn't agree? What about if she has a concern? What if she has a different opinion? Or she has a suggestion? How do you handle that as a man? Do you shut her down? Do you talk her down? Do you discourage that? Do you say, let's not talk about this again? Do you listen? Because if you are able to listen, able to receive that feedback, you know what? Your wife is going to respect you a lot more. And like I said, be willing to hold your opinion. Because you, know, you, could, just, you could just command your wife to do something. But you know what? If you can convince your wife to share your same convictions, you'll be more successful at having her obey your commands, right? Because she now understands why you've made the decision you've made. James 1, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. You see, you listen first, you hear first, and slow to speak, slow to wrath. And it's very important, men, that you are the one that is more swift to hear and slow to speak, slow to wrath, because you ought to be the one that is more emotionally stable in your family. You know, so that's another area you can lead in. If you find yourself, you're the one getting stressed out, you're the one getting riled up all the time, you're the one getting emotional, you need to dial down the femininity in your life and dial up the masculinity, right? <laughs> because you have to be the emotional stability in your family. You're expected to be, right? So 
That's how it should be. You should be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now, if you can provide that sober foundation in your marriage, that emotional stability in stressful times, you'll learn to trust your judgment more often. Proverbs 18, look at this. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So why is it important? What's another reason why it's important that you listen to your wife? Because you want to you, you wanna build an environment where you're on the same team. So in your family, you want your wife to feel like you guys are, are a team together, that she's not just your servant, you know, in the background doing, you know, whatever you ask her to do. Because some women feel like that, especially when you don't include her in your plans and, you know, you don't feel like she's really a part of it. And, and many Christian men make this mistake because they're a man on a mission, right? And sometimes part of that mission is they need that wife with the children. So sometimes they get married, they have the wife and the children, not because they even care about the wife and the children, they just need to tick that box. You know, they need to tick that box. I need children, I need wife to do this thing, and that's done, and I just leave my wife to it. And you know what? If you don't have that relationship with your wife, you don't have that sort of team mentality, your wife is going to start being resentful for the decisions you make, rather than including her in these decisions to make those examples, right? Make, make those, those decisions. So do you make your family feel like a team? Or is she just your servant? Are you considerate of her preferences or work? So let's talk about a practical example where, you know, I think this happens a lot in homes, where, you know, wives are expected to take care of the home. They're expected to clean up and expected to do these sorts of things. But are you, are you considerate of what she has to do? So let's say, for example, you know, your wife, you expect her to wash your clothes. So do you, like, not care at all how dirty your clothes get? You just make a complete mess of them. You know, your, your clothes have all dirt in the pockets and sand and everything. You still chuck it in the laundry basket. You, know, you don't even have the decency to, like, empty out the pockets and things like that. You know, put it in a way, you know, like in my house, I maybe, maybe I'm pedantic about these things with my kids, but I tell you what, if you do these things in your home, you make it a lot easier for your wife. Like, I'm very pedantic about, like, my kids sitting at the table and how they eat. But you know, one thing I'm pedantic about is when they take their clothes off, that they straighten them out before putting them in the wash. You know what I mean? Because you know what kids do? They just you know, take on, their sleeves are all rolled up, they take their socks off, turn them inside, and it's just all like this ball of sock. And it's just like in there. So then what does your wife have to do? She's going to take them all out to clean them. Right? But you as a man, you can see that in your kids. If you can see your kids with a behavior that you know is making it hard for your wife, why don't you do something about it? Correct it. Start setting that example. You take the time to, hey, look, I want this. You, you know, sometimes I'll go past the laundry basket and be like, all right, who did that? All right, whose clothes are these? Get them to come back and get it. I'm going to wait for my wife to do that. I see it. I deal with it. You know, and then when you do that, your wife's going to respect you because you can, she can see that you're leading in those areas. So are you considerate? You know, it's like if the laundry basket's there, why are your clothes there? Just like... You know, you, just, you get home, ah, oh, it's such a hard day, throw all your clothes off. What is your wife like? Is she just like this servant of yours? You know, is that how you treat her? If you treat her that way, you know what? She's going to lose respect for you, and you wonder why you have trouble, right? So if you are considerate of your wife, right, just put it in the laundry basket. Yeah? Okay? That's fine. Everyone's marriage just got a little bit better. <laughs> So not only that, you know, make things easy for, uh, you know, tools, you know, tools and appliances at home. These are things as well. You li we live in a day and age where we don't live right next to each other. Ideally, you know, you live down the road and you lived around the corner. You know, women need help, you just walk down the road. Unfortunately, the day and age we live with in because of communication, you know, we have a group of people here that live very far from each other. Right, so if I expect my wife to take care and homeschool five children. Now I've got to give her the tools to be able to do that. You know, if the dishwasher breaks, I've got to make sure it gets fixed. You know, these sort of things. Don't delay, oh, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I don't fix these things. No, no, no. If you expect your wife to do these things for you, you make it a priority that her job is as easy as possible. 
right? And she knows that you're taking care of her. You're looking after her. You're considerate of her. You know, you're out of the shops. You're coming home from work. Honey. I don't, I don't call her honey. But in, in my example, my wife's always honey, right? <laughs> honey, you, know, you need anything from the shops? That sort of thing. Right? So if you consider her a thing, then you consider it, then she's going to feel loved. She's going to feel, re- she's going to feel respected. And then in likewise, she'll return the favor. <coughs> So she's going to respect your decisions if her concerns have been addressed. It will reinforce her love for you if her opinion matters. So coming back to listening, it's my last, it's on my last point here, is, see, do you create this destructive environment in your home where this, this destructive environment for communication? Where you create like no-go zones, topics are off limits, you know, she's got continuing concerns but she can't bring them up with you. You know, do you let her discuss them with you rather than shutting them down? See, I would strongly advise against doing things, having no-go zones. You know, when you say things like, oh, we don't talk about those things. Or, I don't want you to bring that up again. These sort of things destroy a relationship. Because why? Because you're shutting down the lines of communication between yourself and your wife. And you may say, well, she can talk to me about anything else but this. Yeah, but what if that thing is really important to her? And she can't bring it up. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hinder the communication between you two. And you know what? If you hinder the communication between husband and wife, it's going to affect the relationship. Right? So the relationship has to be open. You need to be able to talk about anything. You, there should never be a time where it's, we don't talk about those things. Now, we don't discuss that. That's a no-go zone. Honey, I don't want you to bring this up again. Let's not talk about this. To me, um, that is not healthy. Now, is there maybe a time to talk about it and not to talk about it? Sure. You know, if she's bringing up something and it's not appropriate time, it's better to say, hey, let's, let's talk about this later. We'll talk about it when we go home or we'll address it later. And if you do that, make sure you bring it up. Don't brush it off and then not bring it up later, right? Because that's another way you'll lose respect in the eyes of your wife. Because you don't have any integrity in what you said. Right? So if you said, hey, let's talk about it later, when you get home, you be the one to bring it up. If you get home and then she's like, hey, you said we'd talk about this later, you're just losing the notch in that respect every time those things happen. You know, so you need to think about these things. Look at what it says here in James 1. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. I love this passage when it says, God abradeth not. It just shows you can keep going to God. You can keep going to God and asking for things. And God's not going to tell you off for coming to him too much. Will he say no sometimes? Yeah. But he doesn't get upset because you keep bringing things up. And the best parable in regards to this, when Jesus talks about prayer, and he gives this parable of this widow with this uh, unjust judge. Look what it says here. He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So this judge, why he's called the unjust judge? Because he's not doing it because he's... He's, he fears God, or he wants to do what's right by man. He's just saying, oh, this woman just will not leave me alone. So I'm going to do this. Get off my back. Right? Lest by her continual coming, she weary me. And the Lord said, hear what the unjudge, judge, unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, <coughs> though... He bear long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. So what is God saying here? He's basically saying God is not like this unjust judge. So he's saying, think about how the unjust judge responded. Would not God respond very differently? Because he's not an unjust judge. But my point here is, you want to be like your heavenly father. You know, you want to keep those lines of communication open so that your wife can come to you with concerns. And, you know, if she feels like you listen to her, 
She feels like you respect her opinions. You may not always agree. She will be more likely to go with what you say to do once you've discussed her. Make her feel like a team member. Could you just command her? Yes, you could. But is that always the wisest thing to do? No, it's not. So in conclusion, like I said, this sermon is not so much about how to be an obedient wife. This sermon is about how to have an obedient wife. And how do you get your wife to follow you? You need to be somebody worth following. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the reminder from your word. Lord, um, the standards in your word are just unattainably high. So, Lord, we're not, we're not trying. We, we know we can't be perfect, but, Lord, when we know what perfection is. We know what we're striving for. Give us, Lord, the grace to head in that direction. I pray, Lord, for all the men in this church. I pray that they would pick up the mantle, that they would take this upon themselves. They would lead their homes and lead their wives by example, Lord, in knowledge and in, and in conversation and in, in the way they behave. And uh, Lord, I just pray that and pray that you'll give them the grace to do that. So help us, Lord. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.